The focus of this course is Galois theory. And the starting point for Galois theory was the question about solvability of equations in radicals. For quadratic equations, there is a well-known formula that expresses the roots of the quadratic expressions using the operation of square root. Similar but more complicated formulas exist for equations of degree 3 and 4. There was a long search for the general formula for the solution of equations of degree 5 using radicals. And it was a big discovery that such a formula in general does not exist. For a general equation of degree 5, it is not possible to solve it using the operation of uh, taking roots of degree 2, 3, 4, and 5. Some equations of degree 5 and higher, however, are still solvable using radicals. And the distinction between solvable equations and non-solvable equations lies in their Galois group. It turns out that the criterion for solvability of an equation in terms of radical can be formulated in purely group theoretic terms about its Galois group. Galois groups that correspond to solvable equations are called solvable groups. In this lecture, we are going to explore this group theoretic condition that makes uh, polynomial equations solvable in radicals. Let A and B be two elements in the group G. The commutator of A and B is the following expression. It's A times B times A inverse times B inverse. We note that uh, the inverse of a commutator is again a commutator. So if we take A, B, A inverse, B inverse, inverse, then this will be B times A times B inverse times A inverse. So the inverse of the commutator of A and B is the commutator of B and A. Now we have the definition. The commutator subgroup G1 in G is uh, the subgroup generated by all commutators in G. We point out that the set of commutators does not form a subgroup. And so when we generate a subgroup by commutators, we have to take products of them. So this tells us that G1 is uh, the set of elements C1 times C2 times Cn, where each Cg can be written as Aj Bj times Aj inverse times Bj inverse. And we have an obvious lemma that uh, G1 is equal to identity if and only if G is abelian. Now let us give a proof. So if G is abelian, so from here it follows that for all A and B in G, the commutator A B A inverse B inverse is equal to A times A inverse times B times B inverse and is equal to identity. So for abelian groups, all commutators are identity elements and for this reason the commutator subgroup is also equal to identity. Let us prove the converse. So if the commutator subgroup is identity, this follows that for all A and B in G, A, B times A inverse times B inverse is equal to identity. But uh, now if we multiply this by B on the right, we get that A, B, A inverse is equal to B. And now if we multiply by A on the right, so this implies that A, B is equal to B, A. And uh, since this holds for all A and B, so this implies that G is abelian. So we can see 
that uh, the commutator measures the degree of non-commutativity of these two elements, A and B. And for commuting elements, the commutator is equal to identity. Likewise, the commutator subgroup measures the degree to which the group G is non-abelian. For abelian groups, this commutator subgroup is trivial. Now, let H and K be two subgroups in G. Then uh, the mutual commutator subgroup H with K is uh, the subgroup generated by commutators A, B, A inverse, B inverse, where A is in H and B is in K. The elements of this subgroup are products of uh, commutators or their inverses. So we'll write plus minus 1, C2 plus minus 1, times Cn plus minus 1, where Cj is Aj, Bj, Aj inverse, and Bj inverse, where Aj is an H and Bj is in K. We describe the properties of the mutual commutator using the following proposition. A. If H prime is a subgroup in H and K prime is in subgroup in K, then the mutual commutator H prime K prime is a subgroup in the mutual commutator of H and K. B. If phi from G to S is a group homomorphism then phi of the mutual commutator HK is equal to the commutator of phi of H with phi of K. And C, if H and K are normal in G, then the mutual commutator HK is also normal in G. For the proof, part A is obvious, just follows from the definition. Part B follows from uh, the fact that the homomorphic image of a commutator A, B, A inverse, B inverse, is uh, a commutator itself. So phi of A times phi of B times phi of A inverse times phi of B inverse. Using this fact, we can see the inclusion in uh, this direction and also the pre-image of uh, any commutator uh, in here is a commutator from H and K. So this inclusion also holds. Now for part C, let's recall what does it mean that H is normal in G. So this is equivalent to saying that for all X in G and for all H in H, the conjugate X, H, X inverse still belongs to H. And here we can see that the conjugate of a commutator is uh, again a commutator. If we conjugate a commutator x times a b a inverse b inverse times x inverse, this can be written in the following way. It's x a x inverse times x b x inverse 
times x a x inverse all inverse times x b x inverse all inverse. We can see that all middle factors of x and x inverse will cancel and we get the left hand side. So the conclusion is that the conjugate of a commutator is again a commutator. Moreover, if h is normal in G and A is an element of H, then by definition of a normal subgroup, we have that X A X inverse is again in H. Likewise, if K is normal in G and B is an element of K, then it implies that X B X inverse belongs to K. And then we conclude that the conjugate of the commutator from H K will again belong, belong to the mutual commutator of H and K. And the same will be also true for the products. So if we take conjugate of a product of commutators from H K, this will be a product of commutators from H K, and thus will be an element of H K. This proves that uh, if H and K are normal, then their mutual commutator is also normal in G. We point out that um, if h and k are normal in G, then uh, this implies that uh, the mutual commutator subgroup is actually belongs to the intersection of h and k. If we can see the commutator from h k, then uh, the first element a will be an h, and this product is a conjugate of an element from h, and because h is normal, this conjugate is also in H. So this proves that this commutator will be in H. And in a symmetric way, we can prove that this commutator is also in K. Next, we define two chains of subgroups. First chain is higher order commutator subgroups. Here we'll have G, will contain G1, which we already defined, contains G2, G3, and so on. G1, we have already defined, it. this is a subgroup generated by commutators of G, and then inductively higher order commutator subgroups are defined as mutual commutators of Gn with Gn. So for example, G2 is a mutual commutator of G1 with itself, which is the same as the commutator subgroup of G1. In addition to this, we define what is called lower central series. So here we have G contains G1, contains G2, and so on. So these subgroups are defined inductively in the following way. So the first uh, subgroup of the lower central series is the same as the first commutator subgroup. And then higher order subgroups in the lower central series are mutual commutators of G n with G. And now we can see some basic properties that um, the commutator subgroups and the subgroups of the lower central series are normal in G. And uh, this is proved by induction on N. Let us see. So we define G1 as the mutual commutator of G with itself. Trivially, G is a normal subgroup in G. And we proved that the mutual commutator of two normal subgroups is a normal subgroup. So this means that G1 is normal. Then if we take G2, this is a mutual commutator of G1 with G1. But by what we just have proved, G1 is a normal subgroup. So the mutual commutator of two normal subgroups is normal in G. And so this is a normal subgroup. Likewise, for the lower central series, we have the mutual commutator of G1 with G. And again, G1 is normal in G, and G is normal in G, and we get that this is normal in G. And clearly, this holds by induction for all n. 
The second property that these chains are nested. So this means that uh, Gn contains Gn plus 1. And similarly for the lower central series. This fact follows from uh, this remark that uh, we proved for normal subgroups the mutual commutator sits inside each of the two subgroups. And one more property is that the nth commutator subgroup is contained inside the nth subgroup of the lower central series. And uh, we can prove this by induction with the basis of induction n equals 1 being trivial, so here these two subgroups are the same, and uh, if we take g n plus 1, this is a mutual commutator of g n with uh, g n, and by the induction assumption, so g n is contained inside g lower n, and uh, the second g n is contained inside g. And this is the n plus first uh, subgroup of the lower central series. Now we give the main definitions of this lecture. So definition. A group G is called solvable if there exists a natural number n such that the nth commutator subgroup is equal to identity. And the second definition that a group G is called nilpotent if there exists a natural number n such that the nth subgroup of a lower central series is equal to identity. Let us give examples. So if we take n to be the set of matrices with ones on the diagonal, zeros below the diagonal, and something above the diagonal, so this will be a nilpotent subgroup in G, L, N, F. What happens here that when we take the commutator subgroup, then uh, the set of matrices that we will get will have ones on the diagonal, zero just above the diagonal, and then something above that. And when we take the second subgroup of a lower central series, we are going to get ones on the diagonal then we will get two diagonals of zeros and then something in the corner. And as we take higher and higher subgroups of a lower central series, so these zeros propagate uh, upwards until we end up with the identity matrix. If we take a subgroup B inside GLNF of upper triangular invertible matrices, then we will get that B is solvable but not nilpotent. And I leave uh, to check this fact for you as an exercise. Now let us state the following lemma. If uh, G is nilpotent, then this implies that G is solvable. And the proof is that if G is nilpotent, this implies that there exists a natural number n such that the subgroup of the lower central series is equal to identity. But what we have just proved is that uh, the nth commutator subgroup is contained inside uh, the nth subgroup of the lower central series, but if this one is equal to identity, this implies 
that uh, the nth commutator subgroup is also equal to identity. And uh, this tells us that uh, this group G, by definition, is solvable. Let us state two more simple lemmas. If H is a subgroup in uh, a solvable or respectively nilpotent group G, then H is uh, solvable itself or respectively nilpotent. And this obviously follows from the fact that, uh, say, nth commutator subgroup of H is contained in nth commutator subgroup of G. And so if this subgroup is identity, then this subgroup is identity. And the same holds for subgroups of the lower central series. Another lemma says that uh, if phi from G to S is um, a surjective group homomorphism, and um, G is solvable, or respectively nilpotent, then S is solvable, or respectively nilpotent. And this follows from uh, the very first proposition that we proved that implies that phi of uh, nth commutator subgroup is uh, the nth commutator subgroup of phi of G. And the same is uh, for the subgroup of the lower central series. Let us characterize solvable and nilpotent subgroups. Let us begin with nilpotent subgroups. So we have the following theorem. One, if uh, G is nilpotent, then uh, the center of G is not equal to identity. So nilpotent subgroups have non-trivial centers. And two, if we have that the quotient of a group by its center is nilpotent, then G is nilpotent. This gives us an inductive procedure how to test whether a group is nilpotent. So first of all, we look at the center. If the center is trivial, then this group is not nilpotent. And if the center is non-trivial, then we can quotient by the center and check whether this uh, smaller group is uh, nilpotent or not. And this last lemma tells us that if G is nilpotent, then this quotient by actually any subgroup uh, is uh, nilpotent. Let's give a proof of this. So for one, so assume that G is nilpotent, then there exists a natural number n such that the nth subgroup of the lower central series is identity, but the previous subgroup is not equal to identity. Now, let us recall the definition of uh, nth subgroup of the lower central series. This is a mutual commutator of g n minus 1 with g. And uh, by this uh, statement here, so this is equal to identity. So what does this mean? So this means that for all A in uh, the n minus first subgroup of the lowest central series, and for all B in G, the commutator AB 
a minus 1 b minus 1 is equal to identity, which is equivalent to saying that a b is equal to b a. So we conclude that all elements of uh, n minus first subgroup of the lower central series commute with all elements of b. And this implies that n minus first subgroup of the lower central series sits inside the center of G. And since uh, this subgroup is not equal to identity, this tells us that the center of uh, the group is not equal to identity either. Now let us prove part two. We consider a group homomorphism pi from uh, G to the quotient of G by Z of G. This is a canonical projection of a group to its uh, quotient group and uh, thus it's surjective. By our assumption this quotient group by the center is nilpotent. So this tells us that there exists a natural number n such that the nth term of the lower central series of this group is identity. Because homomorphism pi is surjective, we know that this is equal to the image of uh, the nth subgroup of the lower central series of G. So this tells us that uh, nth subgroup of the lower central series uh, of G belongs to the kernel of pi. But what is the kernel of this canonical projection? So the kernel of this projection is the center of the group G. But then what is G n plus 1? So this is a mutual commutator of G n with G. But this sits uh, inside the mutual commutator of the center with the group. And uh, the elements of the center commute with uh, any element of the group. So this means that all commutators of this kind are trivial. And so this is equal to identity. So here we show that n plus first term of the lower central series is identity, so which implies that G is nilpotent. So what we see is that if nilpotency degree of the quotient of G by the center is n, then the nilpotency degree of G is at most n plus 1. Let us state an analogous theorem for the solvable groups. Let n be a normal subgroup in G. If both n and the quotient group G quotient by n are solvable, then G is solvable. And we already have seen the converse of this. So if we have a solvable group, then it's any subgroup is solvable and any quotient group is also solvable. Let's give a proof of this theorem. Again, consider the canonical projection from uh, pi from G to G quotient by N. And this map is surjective since it's a canonical projection. So by assumption, we have that there exist k and m such that the kth commutator subgroup of n is identity and the mth commutator subgroup of the quotient is identity. Then since we have a surjective group homomorphism, the image of uh, the mth commutator subgroup of G under this canonical projection is equal to the mth commutator subgroup 
of uh, the image. And this is identity. Since the image of this subgroup is identity, so this tells us that uh, the mth commutator subgroup of uh, G sits in the kernel of pi, which is n. And uh, since uh, the mth commutator subgroup of G sits in a m, so this tells us that uh, m plus first commutator subgroup sits inside the commutator subgroup of n. And m plus second commutator subgroup of G sits in the second commutator subgroup of n. And in particular, so this tells us that the commutator subgroup with index m plus k sits inside kth commutator subgroup of n, which is identity. And this tells us that G is solvable. So what we get here is that if we have solvability degrees for the normal subgroup and for the quotient, then the solvability degree of G is at most the sum of these two indices. We point out that the second theorem gives us more flexibility than the theorem about nilpotent groups. Because for nilpotent groups, uh, we have to consider the quotient by the center. Whereas uh, when we study, when a group is solvable, we can take the quotient by any normal subgroup. Let's consider an example. We can take n to be the commutator subgroup of G. Then we know that this is normal in G. We know that the quotient G by the commutator subgroup is always abelian. To prove this, we consider the canonical projection from G to this quotient. And then the commutator of uh, this quotient is equal to pi of uh, G1, but by definition, G1 sits in the kernel of pi. And so this means that this becomes identity. And the commutator subgroup of a group is identity if and only if this uh, group is abelian. And of course, if the group is abelian, automatically it is uh, solvable. And then this theorem gives us uh, a somewhat tautological condition that G is solvable if and only if G1 is solvable. Of course, this also follows from the definition of, uh, of a solvable group. Next, we're going to explore the connection with uh, P groups that we discussed last time. Proposition. Let order of G is P to the power of N where p is a prime and n is greater or equal to 1. Then the center of this group is not equal to identity. Proof. We consider the action of G on itself by conjugation. We know that for every G in G, the orbit of G or the conjugacy class of G has size which is uh, a divisor of the order of G. So this is P to the power N. So from here it says that the size of uh, each orbit is p to the power of k for some k. What does it mean that uh, the size of the orbit of g is equal to 1? This is equivalent to saying that for all a in g, a g a inverse is equal to g. Or equivalently for all a in g, a g is equal to g a. And this says that g belongs to center of the group. 
Now we reason by contradiction. So if the center of the group is trivial, consists of identity element, then we have one orbit of uh, length 1 and sizes of uh, all other orbits are divisible by p. Now we consider the partitioning of our set, which is G in this case, into the disjoint union of orbits. Then the total size of our set is p to the power n. And we have one orbit of length 1 plus orbits that are all multiples of p. And obviously this gives us a contradiction. So this contradiction came from uh, the fact that we assumed that uh, the center of the group consists of a single element. Thus, the center of uh, a p-group is non-trivial. Now we can prove the following theorem. Let order of g be the power of a prime. Then g is nilpotent. So we're saying here that every p group is nilpotent. So we give the proof of this by induction on n here. So if n is equal to 1, so our basis of induction, then the order of g is equal to p. And we know that in this case g is isomorphic to a cyclic group zp. And uh, thus, g is abelian and hence it's nilpotent. Now the step of induction. So we assume that for all k that are strictly less than n, any group of uh, order p to the power of k is nilpotent. Now we take the group G of order p to the power n. By the previous proposition, the center of uh, this group is uh, not equal to identity. And uh, then this implies that the quotient of G by the center of G has order which is p to the power of k where k is less than n. By induction assumption this quotient of G by the center is nilpotent. But then we have this characterization of nilpotent groups. If the quotient by the center is nilpotent, then this implies that G is also nilpotent. And this completes the proof of this theorem. When n is equal to 1, we said that any group of uh, prime order p is cyclic. What happens if n is equal to 2? So here we have the following theorem. A group g of order p squared is abelian. And as a corollary, we get that if order of g is equal to p squared, then either g is cyclic, so a cyclic group of order p squared, or g is isomorphic to zp plus zp. So this follows from uh, the classification of finite abelian groups, that there are up to an isomorphism, there are exactly two abelian groups of order p squared. 
In order to prove uh, this theorem, we need the following proposition. If the quotient of G by its center is uh, cyclic, then G is abelian. Actually, this proposition says that this condition cannot hold, that the quotient of G by the center cannot be a non-trivial cyclic group. And if G is abelian, then uh, the center of G is equal to G, and so this cyclic group has order 1. Let's prove the proposition. So suppose this uh, quotient is indeed cyclic and generated by some element h. This tells us that the group G is uh, the union of the following cosets. It's uh, the union over k in z of h to the power of k times z of g. So this tells us that for every element g in our group, there exists a value of k and there exists an element of uh, the center such that g is equal to h to the power of k times z. Now let us take two elements uh, from the group g. So we have g1 is h to the power of k1 times z1 and g2 is h to the power of k2 times z2. Then what is g1 times g2? So this is h to the power of k1 z1 times h to the power of k2 z2, but z are elements of the center, so they commute. So this means that this is equal to h to the power of k1 plus k2 times z1 times z2. But then we see that if we take the product of these two elements in the opposite order, then we get exactly the same thing, h to the power of k1, k2, z1 times z2. And we see that all elements in G commute, so thus uh, the group is abelian. Now we can prove the theorem about groups of order p squared. So suppose order of G is equal to p squared. We proved that any group of order p to the power of n has a non-trivial center. So this tells us that the center of G is not equal to identity. By Lagrange's theorem, the order of the center is a divisor of p squared. So this tells us that the order of the center can be either p squared or p. If the order of the center is equal to p, then this tells us that the quotient of g by the center also has order p. So this is p squared divided by p. But then if a group has order p, which is a prime number, so this tells us that the quotient of g by z of g is cyclic of order p. And we just proved that this is impossible. So if this group is cyclic, then it has order 1. So this gives us a contradiction which tells us that the order of the center cannot be p. And thus we conclude that the order of the center of the group is equal to p squared. And this means that all elements in G commute with each other. So this tells us that G is abelian.